Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, Dan and I dig into the annual Thanksgiving mailbag to answer all your midterm questions and more. Or, to quote Dan, the episode where I reveal which book I read this year. <laughs> <laughs> we are all waiting with bated breath. <laughs> All right, let's get to your questions. Evelyn Two asks, can we say now with relative clarity which voters surprised us and moved the midterm results in Democrats' favor? Was it young single women, Gen Z, black voters, etc.? Question mark. No, we can't say that yet. <laughs> I mean, we can. I mean, next, I just, I... next question. <laughs> yes. I mean, we have exit poll data, which yeah. is... Pretty flawed, particularly when you get down to subgroups with a pretty with a pretty monumental margin of error in those subgroups because they're so small. So, with the honest truth, is we do not know yet which groups really both outperformed in terms of turnout and outperformed in terms of support. So, we do not know the answer to that yet. A lot of people with a lot of theories and thoughts, some of them are going to end up being right, but we don't know with precision the right answer to that yet. Can I just say though? Uh, and def- I'm going to defend the exit polls here. I didn't because I didn't fully realize this until I, I dug in. Do you know the 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 Edison exit poll, which is what the networks use? That it, that did they they did twenty thousand interviews. Twenty thousand interviews is like so many more interviews than any poll that we ever talk about on this podcast. <laughs> and then Votecast did ninety AP Votecast did ninety thousand interviews for their exit poll and. Both of those exit polls are now weighted to the results in all these districts. So that makes them a little bit more accurate. And you can also start looking at turnout differentials in district by district where all the votes have been counted. So you can so we're, so there's some subgroups that we're not going to know, but some we still we can start getting an idea just by looking at the district. Yeah, we can. You can make you can make guesses based on regional. If you would have knowledge about what the primary population of that precinct or district is, yes, you can make some. But just when there is a tendency to write the forever story of politics and then make a series of multi-billion-dollar strategic decisions based on these exit polls, and I would just tell everyone to just like hold their horses for a minute. I will give you a few things that we know or that we think we know. Overall turnout. Looks like it was down from 2018, but still higher than any midterm in decades, I think at least since 1970. So the the 2018 anti-Trump coalition that showed up, there was some erosion from that, but still pretty strong. Not 2010, not 2014 when there were big red waves. Overall, we're going to know that the, we know that the electorate was more Republican than it was in 18 or 20. More Republicans turned out than Democrats. How many more? How much more turnout? We don't know yet. We're still waiting for results, but we know that it was more. Uh, we know that independents made the difference. In the blue waves of 2018 and 2006, independents broke for Democrats by 18 points. In the red waves of 2010 and 2014, they broke for Republicans by 19 and 12 points, respectively. In these midterms, uh, it looks like they broke for Dems by two points. Again, as more numbers come in, that can change a little bit. But it, the split, the the close split with independents, is still notable and something that we can um, we can we probably know now. Youth turnout, a lot of articles about youth turnout I've seen. It was down from 2018, but higher than 2010 and higher than 2014. Um, but it was still down from 2018. In 2018. Voters under 30 went for Democrats, 67 to 32. In 2022, slightly worse margin, 63-35. Uh, under 30s made up 12% of the electorate uh, versus 13% of the electorate in 2018. So pretty close. And all that is from the Tufts data that everyone is citing to say that youth turnout was high. Because again, it was high, but it just wasn't as high in 2018. Um, one thing that uh, Kristen Soltis Anderson, who's a, a Republican pollster, but She's like a never Trumper and also focuses on the youth vote. Um, she pointed out that while youth turnout under 30 vote was pretty much the same as 2018 in terms of margin, maybe a little less in terms of turnout, what really screwed Republican Republicans is millennials, 30 to 44. Because in 2010, Republican in the big red wave in 2010, Republicans won voters 30 to 44. In 2022, Democrats won those voters by 11 points. 
a huge shift. So the real problem with the Republican Party is they were losing young voters when millennials were the under 30 crew. But now that millennials have aged into the 30 to 44 crew, they're losing both millennials and Gen Z, which is going to be a real problem for the Republican Party. I thought that was interesting because that means basically both the Obama generation and now the generation that's younger are now uh, pretty anti-Republican. There are two things about this that are just worth noting, then we can move on to all the other questions or because instead of spending 20 minutes on the first one, but is <laughs> one, the because of the high turnout, not as high as 18, but much higher than 10 and 14, this midterm probably tells us a little bit more about 2024 than the old midterms. It used to be yeah. throw That's out the point. midterm. It you know, it's 2010 told us nothing about 2012, 94 told us about 96. It you, just because the there was this giant delta between midterm turnout and It's like almost like it was happening in another half a nation, right? Second thing is that the people it used to be that voters would change their party as they got older. Yeah. Right. You, that you would be a young. This happened particularly with the boomers. Right. They would be they were liberals in the 60s. And then as they got older, uh, became Republican. People are now sticking with their original partisan identity throughout the bulk of their life. So these are the, the same. It's not that the voters within that cohort shifted from Republican to Democrat. It's just the people who were Democrat got older. And then they're going to go older again. And that does for all the there's all all the talk about the demographic demise of the Republican Party. The real dramatic one is if they are not backfilling the voters who are who are aging into the electorate as we are. That is that is sort of the challenge there. Yeah. And last point I'll make on this just to answer uh, Evelyn's question. I think there's a tendency after an election to look at one demographic group or one age or whatever and say, oh, these are the people that helped win whichever part of the election. I think in an election with turnout so high from both sides, everything mattered. (laughs) Every like if turnout in any of the groups that we've talked about was down, we could have lost the Senate. If uh, we lost some independence, we would have lost the Senate. It was making sure that our base turned out. It was making sure that independents and moderates were persuaded. It was all of the above in an election where that many Republicans turned out on the other side. Um, All right. Thanks, Timming asks, abortion seemingly brought Democratic candidates more success in flipping state legislatures and passing the referendums. How do you revisit the issue in 2024 at a national level? What's next on abortion? Well, you know, we we had this world that we'd hoped for where Democrats control the House and we would have 52 senators, uh, 50 of whom uh, would would abolish a filibuster to pass the um, to codify Roe or some some law like that. That is not the world we currently live in. But I think there, there are ways to keep this going. There are going to be Demo- – we now have Democratic governors with Democratic legislators in a lot of core battleground states who can pass laws. There are state – there is a handful of states where we can, like in Michigan, have an initiative on the ballot, like Michigan and California, to have an initiative on the ballot to – Put the right to choose into the Constitution or to, or whatever the process allows there, and to continue to talk about and continue to drive home the Republican extreme position on this issue and all the other issues related to people's personal freedoms. I also think uh, as we look at 2024, we have a Republican president and a Republican Congress in 2024. They're going to ban abortion nationwide. Right. Like, isn't I mean, this was a a, uh, practically a state by state issue in this midterm um, because abortion access really depended on who the governor was or ballot amendments or or ballot initiatives. But in 2024, the the presidency is at stake. And if if Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis wins and there's a Republican Congress, I can't I mean, I don't even think they'll pass the the Lindsey Lindsey Graham 15 week abortion ban. I feel like they'll uh, they'll they'll. Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis in a primary will get pushed to saying that they will have a complete abortion ban. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think that's true. My best guess is that when they do, they finally stop fighting with each other and sit down and try to figure out what went wrong here. One of the issues that Republicans will decide they're going to talk less about is yeah. abortion. But the issue, what I think will affect this is whether there's a Republican primary or not. Because now they're going to have to start competing 
you know, whether it's Trump and DeSantis or Trump, DeSantis, Pence or Nikki Haley or Greg Gutfeld or whatever fucking yahoos <laughs> are going to run for that job, the – you know, they're, they're going to be competing for that hardcore Republican base that pushes these extreme bans with no exceptions. And yeah. much like in 2012, when the, party, the Republican Party defined themselves out of the mainstream on immigration in that primary, you can see a similar dynamic potentially taking place here. And you know, it'll be coming upon all of us and Democratic politicians that when Republicans anywhere in the country, uh, whether they're trying to pass at the state level or the county level or you know in a, na- a neighborhood, try to pass some extreme abortion law that we call it out and draw attention to it and use it to point out the dangerous extremism on that side. Yeah, agreed. Alec Logi asks, I often forgot split ticket voters exist, but who are they? What are they thinking? Do you know what they're thinking, Dan? <laughs> I, I, I do not. I would like to just meet the uh, small handful of Kerry Lake, Mark Kelly voters and just see like what, what they were thinking. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, mean we I, know, you know there were a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, there were some. I think there were fewer than we thought um, going into this, right? We thought that there could be huge, gigantic gaps in, between – uh, you know, Kemp and a, you know Kemp and Warnock and all of that, but there were there certainly were some, and so there, I think there are two groups of split ticket voters that are worth yeah thinking about. One are the people who actually voted because f- who were presented with a choice between a completely extreme Republican candidate and one part of the ticket running against a broadly acceptable Democrat, and then a more uh, appealing Republican candidate, other part, and they did split their ticket. Like, I think Pennsylvania and Georgia are the two examples where the where there were the most of those, and you can sort of see how some of those people may have made those decisions. Where they're like, "I'm a Republican, but either I just cannot vote for Doug Mastriano." Like I, you know, I, I, Oz is kind of a weirdo. He's got weird taste in vegetables, but he's more of a Republican than I'm comfortable with than the the guy hanging out on uh, anti Semitic websites. Or you know, same yeah. thing in Georgia where Herschel Walker was just a bridge. Too far, and Donald Trump helped. You know, the only candidate he helped win was Brian Kemp by opposing him, um, and so that helped there. The other split ticket voters are the people who voted for Democrats now, who will be open to voting for Republicans in twenty twenty four. Because, as we know, three quarters of the people who voted for Trump in sixteen or did not vote in sixteen, who then voted for Democrat in eighteen, three quarters of them were very open to voting for Trump up until a couple weeks before the election in twenty twenty. The other thing we don't know about the split ticket voters is if they actually split their ticket. And by that, I mean, so you go, you you have your ballot and you're like, OK, um, I'm going to vote for Dr. Oz. I cannot vote for Doug Mastriano, but I also can't vote for Josh Shapiro. So I'm just going to leave it blank. Um, or did they actually cross over and vote for the other party? And you don't really know that. What we do know is that, like, you know. J.D. Vance got a couple hundred thousand votes less than Mike DeWine. So Nunu got, you know, tens of thousands of votes more than Boldick, right? And on and on and on. So there are a good number of people that did this. You just don't know if they actually crossed over and voted for the other party or left it blank. Um, and I just think that I think the lesson here is voters are complicated. <laughs> people are complicated. And the reason that you don't give up on persuading people is because you don't know what kind of weirdos are out there? <laughs> what, <laughs> you don't know. You don't know who's gonna. Maybe, maybe this person's excited for Carrie Lake, and you can't get them to avoid voting for Carrie Lake. But you can pick up that Mark Kelly vote, and that's still important to get that Mark Kelly vote. You know. You know, there are a lot of people at the highest levels of the Democratic Party who think you would make a great candidate for something one day, but this you might is what I, it. I know <laughs> you were that that was you burning the bridge in front of you <laughs> to be like, and who knows what those weirdos think? You think it's the first time? <laughs> <laughs> you know that you know what we say here. It's recorded and people have it forever. Um, okay, so uh, Rita K asks: We know the polls are flawed. Should we still take presidential approval rating seriously? And similarly, Ash Van Dyke on Instagram asks, how are presidential approval ratings calculated? Is it similar to polls? Okay. I'll take the second question first. Okay. It is, it's not just similar to polls. It is a poll <laughs> where they ask, <laughs> they ask the people, do you approve or disapprove of the president? In some cases, it, you rank it on a scale of four, strongly approve, somewhat approve, somewhat disapprove, strongly disapprove. 
And the presidential approval rating in that poll is just as accurate as the overall poll. So in some cases, that mean may mean incredibly inaccurate. But like with all of these polling results, it's important, I think, to not take any one poll as correct. You want to look at the average of all of the polls. And what's really important on presidential approval rating is trajectory, not level. Because for two reasons. One, is it going up steadily? Is it going down? Or has it been flat for a long period of time? And the it is just unfair to compare current presidents to previous presidents because we with every passing presidency, we become more polarized, which means fewer numbers of the out party are willing to say they support or approve of the president of the other party. And so just your ceiling comes down to you know below 50 in some cases, right? Where it's just it's very, very, very hard to have a number. So even if Biden, you know, they used to say if you're under 50, then you know, the party is going to do terribly in the midterms. Well, Biden just did incredibly well at 42 in traditional polls and 45, I think it was, in the exit polls, yeah. because 45 is sort of the new 50, perhaps, right? It's just we're, we're, we have to we have to measure. We're not measuring it. It's, there's an apples to orange situation happening. Yeah. But I will say I, there are a bunch of these questions, and I can tell that what's behind these questions is like, well, the polls were all, all wrong. So maybe all of these polls showing that President Biden is in the low 40s are wrong. And I, I would I'd get, I'd offer some caution on that <laughs> because, first of all, the polling averages, based, when all was said and done, the polling averages underestimated Democrats by one to one and a half points. That is not that much of a miss at all. And that no, it's be, not a miss. It is not a miss. Not that a miss. is a correct poll. Eric, it, that is a correct poll. The, the averages, even the averages, even skewed as they were with all those dumpster fire Republican polls, still had it pretty close, right? Also, Trump's approval rating in the 2020 exit poll was just about the same as his vote share, right? Which is a good indicator. So, President like you said, President Biden's, Biden's approval rate uh, President Biden's approval rating was 44% in the exit poll in most of the swing states, it's it was 40%, 40-41%. So, that of course that approval could rise. You imagine the man runs an entire presidential campaign with hundreds of millions of dollars of ads. The economy proves it could go up to 45. And you're right, 45, 46, 47. Maybe that's the new 50. But again, you know, it's a two person race. You got to uh, you got to hit that 50 and vote share. So we'll see. But just to, I don't. What I don't want people to do is it's not to say like oh everything's bad or everything's good. It's just to say that like because there were a few misses in certain states and because the narrative got out of hand about the red wave, don't just look at data and throw it away because the polling averages were pretty close. And so when you see President Biden's approval rating, you should say that it's a fairly, it's it's in the ballpark of what people actually think about it. The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is Simply Safe Home Security. It's nice to have somebody on your side. Simply Safe Home Security offers a great way to protect your home and family with advanced security technology and 24-7 professional monitoring. And right now you can get 50% off any new system. Simply Safe was named the best home security system of 2022 by U.S. News and World Report. In an emergency, 24-7 professional monitoring agents use fast protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real. So you can get priority police response. Simply Safe is whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. Their 24-7 professional monitoring service costs under a dollar a day, less than half the price of ADT's traditional professionally installed system. Stay in complete control of your system anytime, anywhere with the top-rated Simply Safe app. Love it. Love Simply Safe. Don't you? Bet you bet I do. Don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do. I set up a Simply Safe, and the app is really great. It works flawlessly. It's completely reliable. It looks nice. They're nice. The 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 pad and the base station all looks good. Highly recommend it. Don't miss your chance for massive savings on our favorite security system. Get 50% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash crooked today. This is their biggest discount of the year. That's simplysafe.com slash crooked, and there's no safe like Simply Safe. Pod Save America is brought to you by Tommy John. Getting stuck in Black Friday crowds? Super uncomfortable. Shopping Tommy John's Black Friday sale from your couch? Super duper comfortable. When you give your loved ones Tommy John, they're that much more comfortable so they can do everything better. Shop Tommy John's Black Friday sale right now and give the gift of comfort to everyone on your list, including yourself, with brand new Tommy John underwear, loungewear, and pajamas. With over 18 million pairs sold, giving Tommy John has become a holiday tradition. 97% of women and men love getting a gift from Tommy John, and the other 3%, screw them. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They got fanatics. Fanatics. We wear Tommy John here. You bet. Pod Save America. Wearing it right now. Love the loungewear. Love the pajamas. Super comfortable. And you can celebrate softness season, which coincidentally is the same as cozy season. It comes the same same month every year. Same couple of months. Cozy season and mm-hmm. softness season. You bet. And it's out in, in the in the southern hemisphere. It's in the summer. Uh, what we what we call summer. Yeah. Do you um, turn the it, clocks back for softness season? <laughs> Every gift is backed by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear. It's free guarantee. Shop Tommy John's Black Friday sale going on right now and get 30% off site-wide at TommyJohn.com slash crooked. 30% off everything now at TommyJohn.com slash crooked. TommyJohn.com slash crooked. See site for details. Pot Save America is brought to you by Be More Organics. With the colder months approaching, nothing is more important than getting enough sleep. Sleep has far-ranging effects on everything from your energy levels to your mood to your immune system and even your hunger levels. That's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I eat more when I, I don't know, sleep enough. I know. I'm, I, that's my today. It's truly your superpower this holiday season, and you do not want to miss those crucial seven to nine hours. I had quesadilla for breakfast. I had five to six last night. Not good enough. I should have had my Beam Dream. Should have had the Beam Dream. Beam Dream. You know, I mean, you know we've been raving about Beam stop. Dream's powder. They're healthy hot cocoa for sleep. Well, today, our listeners get a special discount on a delicious seasonal flavor of Dream Powder. White chocolate peppermint. Boom. Imagine swirls of peppermint and creamy white chocolate, but with only 15 calories. Better sleep has never tasted better. Dream contains natural sleep promoting premium ingredients. It's triple lab tested, contains no THC, and you actually wake up refreshed. A recent clinical study revealed Dream helped 93% of users wake up feeling more refreshed, and 93% reported that Dream helped them get a more restful night's sleep. Just mix Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and enjoy before bedtime. Love Beam Dream. Love their hot cocoa. Can't wait to try their white chocolate peppermint. Can't Gonna wait. give that a whirl. Gotta give that a give, give that a go college try. And then uh, hopefully I will um, I will rest fall, peacefully. Fall into a deep, deep sleep. Find out why Forbes and the New York Times are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. Don't love it? Get your money back guaranteed. If you want to try Beam's best-selling white chocolate peppermint dream powder, it's only available for a limited time, so be sure to grab some before it runs out. Beam's having their biggest sale of the year. Get up to 50% off when you go to shopbeam.com slash crooked and use code cyber at checkout. That's shop, B-E-A-M.com slash crooked and use code cyber for up to 50% off. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life doesn't come with a user manual, so when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills. It's the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. Yeah, that's what we're always saying. BetterHelp offers all the benefits of in-person therapy, plus it's more convenient, more accessible, and more affordable. Talk about a time you wish life came with the user manual. When haven't I wished that, you know? Every day. How do I navigate this challenge? This, this change, crazy thing we call life. This crazy thing we call life. Well, now, now there's something else. Better help. To help. Th- our therapy can help you do that. Therapy can help. Everybody should be in therapy. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched three million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. Couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash PSA. That's betterhelp, hel dot com slash PSA. Jane Peterson asks, how much of the midterms result is due to actual Democratic Party strategy versus demographic change? Are Dems doing a thorough enough self-evaluation for 2024? This one's slightly complicated. Um, all of the things you asked are true. Yeah. <laughs> The Republican Party made a series of grievous errors, both in terms of pushing through the courts, this incredibly extreme uh, policy by overturning Roe v. Wade, and then double, triple, quadruple, quadrupling down it all across the country. They then made that problem even worse by nominating incredibly extreme candidates who believed in conspiracy theories and the big lie and all of those things. Democrats took that political environment and they ran a series of excellent campaigns to play their hand very well. Like that is there's no question about that. It is easy. This is incredibly close race. So it seems to be like this exact thing worked or this exact thing put us over the top. There is a these are dynamic enterprises. There's a lot of nuance here. But we can't live in a world where Democrats always screw up and when Democrats win, uh it's Republicans' fault. Both things are true. They Democrats ran really good humans and the and the candidates who won ran smart, 
well-organized, well-funded strategic races to win. Are we doing enough of a thorough self-examination? Too early to say. I think we do have to recognize that manifest in these results as positive they were are some long-term challenges that are going to be that are going to come to the forefront as soon as 2024. Both in terms of what our coalition looks like, how narrow the electoral map currently is because if you look at these results and you think about that 2024 map, we have zero margin of error. Yeah. Texas has paused in its movement blue or maybe even taken a couple steps back. Ohio is incredibly red. Iowa is very red. North Carolina has been stuck at the for federal races in a state of stasis for 12, you know, 14 years now. Florida incredibly red. So we'd have to win every single state that Biden won, most of them by less than one half of a percent to get over 270. And that is right as we sit here today, the only path you really have almost no states to lose. And so we're going to have to figure that out. These states can become available to us, particularly in North Carolina, if we can readjust our coalition to make it more to include a larger share of working class voters of all races. Politics is so calcified and the electorate is so evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans that 2024 is going to be close no matter who is at the top of the ticket. Just saying it now. It's going to be close. Like you said, the the, the results of this election um, led to that conclusion. The results of 2020, when uh, Joe Biden won by only 40,000 votes across three states, <laughs> even though he won by the popular vote by more, right? And so like a- a 2018 was fairly close. We've now had three incredibly close elections despite a pandemic, uh, massive civil rights protests, uh, everything that has happened, Donald Trump, right? We have still had these incredibly close elections. And so therefore, of course, self-reflection is important. Where I, where I think both of these things, uh, sorry. So of course, self-reflection is important. I would start with, the strategy followed by a lot of these winning campaigns. Like I think the victory in this midterm belongs to like Gretchen Whitmer and Josh Shapiro and Mark Kelly and John Fetterman and and Raphael Warnock and all of these Democrats who ran statewide in very close, evenly divided purple states. Look at their strategies. Look at their messaging. Look at how they did it. Look at the ads they ran. Look at how they made news. Like these are the people that are going to tell us how to win in a very narrowly divided electorate. And like, yeah, maybe Republicans will continue to run lunatics who are unacceptable to most of the electorate, to mo- to most independents, and to even some Republicans. And we'll all be fine. But maybe they'll smarten up, <laughs> and maybe yeah, they'll maybe they'll run that. people who are extreme right wing candidates, but not as uh, obvious in their lunacy. <laughs> you know, they might do that, and if they do do that, then we're going to have to be fucking smart, and we are going to have to do some self reflection because guess what? The turnout in twenty twenty four that changes is you do get a whole bunch more non college voters into the electorate in a presidential year. You get people who aren't paying as close attention to politics, non-college voters, low information voters. They all come into the electorate in 2024. And in some cases that helps Democrats, but in some cases it hurts us. So we really have to be thinking about um, how to uh, how to make sure that we uh, do better uh, in, in 2024. I want to just put in perspective how close the last two presidential elections were, which is they both of them were decided by a group of people, smaller the number of people who attend a major Big Ten college football game <laughs> every Saturday. Yeah. Like, that's just how close this is. I mean, that's not how close it is nationally, but when you put it through the prism of the Electoral College and the Senate, that's how close it is. Yeah. And I just, and again, this is all to just say, like, the red wave narrative was like, just got way out of hand in the week, <laughs> the couple of weeks before the election. And it is very satisfying to uh, dunk on on pundits and and media types and Republicans who are wrong. I'm just saying, like you know, the it's dunking is fine, but also like the 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 focus should be on okay, how do we how do we win next time around? How do we make sure that we win? Because it's not a decisive victory by any means here, and that's not our fault. That's just because that's the way the electorate is. That's just the world that we're living in right now. So uh, we got to, you know, buckle down. Uh, Nick on Twitter asks, should I want, here we go, should I want Trump or DeSantis or someone else, though that seems doubtful, as the 2024 opponent, who do you see as more beatable? 
I mean, th- you were playing a dangerous game, my friend. I know. <laughs> it's <is like, laughs> it like they would both be fucking terrible <laughs> and both of them could win, right? Any Republican nominated in a presidential election will have a very legitimate shot at winning, whether that is Trump, that is DeSantis, that is Nikki Haley, that is Greg Gutfeld, who for some reason I've nominated. Yeah, for wow. You said like, Gutfeld for Gutfeld in 24. I'm just pick, I'm just picking people. Um, Are you hoping he leaves the five so you can join? <laughs> just Juan Wayans has been holding that seat, keeping that seat warm for me for years. <laughs> I don't think he's on there anymore. I don't even know. Who oh yeah, he's got his own show. There. Isn't Jesse Waters the five? Um, Elijah would be correcting he, me right now. Yeah, I mean there there is a putative Democrat on the five God, uh, at all yeah. times. I think um, it's four and against one, but. I think so. I'll try to give this like a serious answer. We don't really know who would be more electable through the prism of this election, which is by which is an imperfect model for 2024. There is a lesson that is borne out by long term political science, which is more extreme candidates tend to lose more more often. And Trump, I don't know, the candidates that were most like Trump, who were closest to Trump, who picked up on Trump's favorite lies and conspiracy theories in his rhetoric and political style, lost in this election. Of the 16 candidates that he endorsed in the six battleground states for statewide office, Senate, governor, and secretary of state, 13 of them lost. Two of them won, Ron Johnson and Joe Lombardo, uh, and and one of them is headed to the runoff. So there's a very clear message about the sort of candidates that are associated with Trumpism who lost in this election. Now we could be in a very different political environment next time around. So we don't we don't really know, but the there the model, the Trump model has not worked for anyone other than Trump. And we should be clear, he almost won last time. Well, and I will also you know, there you'd mentioned political science research. There's also some because I can imagine people saying, more extreme candidate, how is how, then how did Trump win in 2016? Political science, a lot of research shows that a significant number of voters who cast their ballots for him did not see Donald Trump in 2016 as extreme as other Republicans on certain issues. Um, and it was it was not immigration, that's for sure. But on things like, you know, he said he wouldn't cut entitlements. He said he wanted a tax hedge fund. You know, all of it was bullshit. But again, in, in 2020, that wasn't as much the case because People saw that he was president for four years, so they got to know him a little bit. But in 2016, he wasn't seen as extreme as other Republicans. I uh, I did a quick like case for Trump, case for DeSantis. Oh, nice. On, on who's more beatable, because this is what people want to hear, right? <laughs> and I'm not making predictions, but I feel like we can at least, as we're, as, as, if, if just you and I were talking about this, this is how we talk about it. So the case for Trump being more beatable is everyone knows who he is. Everyone has an opinion of him. And for most people, that opinion is that he's not fit for the presidency. That's just the baseline. And like everyone in the electorate has made up their mind. It's hard to see how that changes, right? Like would people who voted against Trump when he was an incumbent president four years ago now decide to vote for him, especially if he's running against the exact same candidate? Hard to see that. But you don't know. I think the case for DeSantis is being more beatable. Trump has been able to turn out voters in 16 and 20 who tend to not vote for other Republicans and tend to have just not turned out in presidential elections before. It's unclear if DeSantis or any other Republican but Trump can get these voters. I also think that DeSantis will not emerge from a primary with Donald Trump unscathed. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Donald Trump will continue to make a life. Uh, Donald Trump will make his life a living hell even after he gets beaten by Del- by Ron DeSantis. Um, and I also think there is a chance to define DeSantis as extreme in a way that Trump didn't seem didn't seem in 2016, because DeSantis has taken so many positions that are in line with the far right of the Republican Party. So that's my case for both of them. Yeah, I think it mm-hmm. is for the. To respond to your Trump case for a second, I agree with everything you said. What he would need to win would be a political environment where Democrats did not turn out those surge voters who came out in 18 and 20. Um, This election suggests that that even without Trump on the ballot, many of them would come out or a third party candidate, who, which is how he won in 16, a series of third party candidates who are bringing his win number closer to at 46 instead of 50. Yeah. Um, DeSantis. If he is able to run as generic non-Trump 
Republican in a environment in a bad political environment for Democrats, he could very easily win. Any Republican could win in that situation. It is the Brian Kemp, and he could emerge from a. There are two ways in which the yeah. Trump um, primary plays out. One is Trump just savages him, and then after even DeSantis squeaks it through, and DeSantis is sort of a stand-in for any number of Republicans here, but you know, savages him and then just savage, you know, tells his people not to vote, you know, threatens a third party run, just makes his life hell. There is another one, which is the Brian Kemp version yeah. of this, where it throws everything at him and he emerges appearing stronger for having beaten Trump and more moderate for having been opposed to Trump. And then every time, time Trump's attacks him, it becomes a um, like a validation of his non-Trumpy, non-MAGA credentials, and he and ends up very strong in that situation. Yeah, and But the point is, we're just playing fucking fantasy politics right now. We No one really has any idea. <laughs> All right. Alexander Hochester asks, is there anything that can be done about the extreme amounts of money being spent per campaign? Even when it comes from small donors, it's still extreme, and it's just becoming an endless cycle of asks. We need to expand the court in overturn Citizens United, <laughs> or um, rewrite the Constitution to make it specific that freedom of speech does not include campaign spending. Um, do we have Those to? Are... Do we have to rewrite the Constitution or expand the court to? Uh stop every democratic campaign from sending those fucking annoying texts <laughs> no uh no that is not that requires actually something more powerful than the constitution i just <laughs> an act of god is apparently what it takes because that is just i can't i can't do it anymore i can't do it one more cycle i don't think it's useful <laughs> you, i mean you're, you're not going to convince me that it's useful um there is a democratic politician who won a campaign eight days prior to us recording this, who sent a text asking for money because Donald Trump announced for president the night before. Already won the campaign. Run, running Already against won person? the campaign. The campaign was called. The race was called. Like four minutes ago. Like, go have a beer, people. Now, I recognize the campaign's probably in debt, but still, just yeah. like if you are going to send out a fundraising text or email right now, it can serve one purpose and one purpose only. It is to help Raphael Warnock in Georgia. <laughs> yeah. Nothing else. I will look if at Raphael Warnock's yourself, text. Totally fine. You're the only one. If you And if you were sending out one of those fucking split things where you say you're raising money for Raphael Warnock, but it's like 20% goes to him and 80% goes to you, fuck you. That is ter that is terrible anyway. It's particularly terrible right now when you don't have a race, people, for at least two years. And don't text me. Okay. A, and don't text me a picture of yourself. That no one, no one texts yeah. by oh, sending a fucking. Oh, Cory Booker himself. being real. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> All right. Like someone can sent around a memo about candidates doing be reels and putting them in fundraising emails as a way to try to ruin the party. <laughs> I figured that one would get you fired up. All right. Yes. Uh, Hannah Degroot asks, please give advice for campaign staff on how to process losing a race. I feel like I should take this one because you've, I think, only lost one race in your life and I've lost a shitload. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, go to the movies. Throw your phone in a river. <laughs> take a break. Do not torture yourself. Do not feel like you have to read all the TikToks about how you lost and how fucking brilliant your lucky opponent who's benefiting from gerrymandering or billions of dollars in PAC money. Just unplug do something else, Tra in travel if you can, take a weekend off, go to the mountains, just get away, unplug, relax. You've earned it. I understand having been in this situation that you, you know, you end the campaign and you have no salary and no job and potentially and you sometimes have to move back from, you know, some state in the middle of nowhere you've been working for the last couple of years. But if you, if you, and you may have to start working right away, but if you get a chance to unplug, do it. Just do not torture yourself. Many great people have worked on many great campaigns and lost, and it happens, and it's painful, but you are better for it. The party is better for it. The, the state you worked in is better for it. And when you are ready, dust yourself off and get back out there. But just do not torture yourself. I completely agree with all of that. Um, and before you do all of that, I think you should go get drunk with all of your campaign friends one last time. Oh, yes. Also, Good point. Yes. I, it's important to have a party. Those are the best parties. The ones that happen after the losing campaign are fucking wild and amazing and great. I was up uh, when when John Kerry lost. I was home in Boston 
uh, and that's where he sort of gave his concession speech too. But before that, it was I, I drove home. I was broke. I was so broke, I didn't have money for the toll on the Mass Pike. <laughs> <laughs> my way home and then i was just at my parents house like by myself sort of like watching the the the, the thing end and then finally like the next day when he gave the concession speech at faneuil hall they had everyone from the campaign go and have like one last night and that was sort of the that party that gathering was like the closure that i needed and then after that everything you said you just you reconnect with family and friends who aren't in politics you don't look at the news and you Exactly. You don't torture yourself. It's great, great advice. Um, all right. Akini asks, how can we help in the Georgia runoff if we don't live in Georgia? Great question. Here's the answer. You can head to votesaveamerica.com. If you want to help out, you can find remote and in-person volunteer opportunities and donate to our Every Last Vote Fund. Uh, this fund is going directly to voter mobilization in Georgia. We have a special focus on in-person early voting, vote by mail, uh, and we're going to help increase turnout among young people and voters of color. Um, please donate now if you can. Uh, Warnock needs the money. The Warnock campaign needs the money. All the Republicans who are all fighting each other, they're all getting together. They're all getting behind Herschel Walker. It's going to be a lot of money in his campaign. So we, uh, Warnock needs all the help we can get, both uh, from a donation standpoint and just uh, your time volunteering. I know everyone's tired, but uh, just one more week here. Um, okay, when we come back, we will take some lighter questions about Taylor Swift, Below Deck, and which book I read this year. Pod Save America is brought to you by Noom. There are so many different reasons to lose weight, like having more energy or improving your mental health. When we decide to lose weight, it's usually not just about the number on the scale. Whatever your reason, Noom Weight is ready to help. Noom Weight's psychology-based approach empowers you with the knowledge and support to build lasting results. To date, Noom Weight has helped more than 3.6 million people lose weight. The program is based on scientific principles like cognitive behavioral therapy to help you understand your relationship with food. Noom Weight is a flexible, non-restrictive program that focuses on progress. Choose your level of support from five-minute daily check-ins to personal coaching. Active Noomers lose an average of 15 pounds in 16 weeks. And 95% of customers say Noom Weight is a good long-term solution. Love it. What do you love about Noom? Here's the thing. All right. I make some bad choices sometimes. All right. And you need something that you kind of keep track of what you're doing, see where you're making progress. And if you fall off the old uh, proverbial uh, wagon there, uh, just a little staircase, get right back on. You know, Noom will help you do that. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom Weight's psychology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com slash cricket. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash cricket to sign up for your trial today. And check out Noom's first ever book, The New Mindset, a deep dive into the psychology of behavior change. Available for pre-order wherever books are sold. Pod Save America is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Nothing is too niche for Squarespace, and whatever your hobby is, you can start your business for it. John John and Tommy share strange, funny things that you think could be a fun niche item to sell or share one of your niche obsessions and encourage listeners to lean into their uniqueness because Squarespace can be so personalized. Wow, that's a... A That's lot a of instructions ass. there. Honestly, should we talk about Phyllis. one of Tommy's niche obsessions since he's since he's not here? Yeah, um, it is. Uh, Tommy likes anime, and as we said, he started a website. Yeah, it's a website. with Squarespace. Squarespace is so easy to so use. So easy to use. You don't have to be some engineer. You can just right out of the box uh, with Squarespace so email can campaigns. Just, can, it's a website devoted to his passion for anime. <laughs> You'll stand out in any inbox. <laughs> Start with an email template and customize it by applying your brand ingredients like site colors and logo. Built-in analytics measure the impact of every send. Squarespace's insights can help grow your business. You can even build a marketing strategy based on your top keywords or most popular products and content thanks to Squarespace analytics. What children we are. Plus, it's easy to display posts from your Twitter, Instagram, and other online accounts with connected social media making your channels. If you remember nothing from this, it's Squarespace. Stand out with a beautiful website. <laughs> website engage with your audience engage sell anything your products content you create even your time head to squarespace.com slash crooked for a free trial and when you're ready to launch use promo code crooked to save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain pods of america is brought to you by bombas gifting bombas. gifting is hard Ugh. we're doing gift as a verb right I here hate, again I hate it. They, 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 they did it to us again <laughs> giving gifts is hard Bombas makes it easy with finding this. the right gift. That's the problem. Finding this is why gifting is a bad. Finding the right gift is hard. Giving right. a gift is easy once you found the right gift. You know how you can solve all those problems? How with Bombas socks? 
their socks feel good and they do good. They do they feel they good. Do. They feel good because they're thoughtfully designed with the softest materials. So comfortable. They do good because they help. You know, because for Bombas. every item you purchase, Bombas donates another to someone in need. Someone needs socks. Bombas socks are cozy upgrades to the everyday sock and are the perfect gift for everyone on your list, including yourself. Bombas uses materials like premium Pima cotton and ultra soft, never itchy merino wool in their socks. Bombas's holiday collection puts a modern twist on traditional festive colors and designs. Think rich purples and greens, geometric snowflake designs, wow. sweater-inspired textures, and retro ski patterns. Because it's not geometric, it's just not a snowflake. Correct. We have Bombas socks in our family. We I got Bombas them. Socks. Emily has them. Charlie has them. So comfortable. They're really, they're, they're cute socks. They feel, they're super comfortable. Give the goods this holiday season with Bombas. Go to bombas.com slash crooked and use code crooked for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash crooked, code crooked for 20% off. Bombas.com slash crooked, code crooked. Okay, uh, we're back with a few more questions. Sarah Danver asks, what's your favorite interview you've done? I mean, obviously, we have to stipulate that we interviewed Barack Obama twice. He's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. Hope change, whatever. Yes. Uh, I would say my favorite one was back in the early days of this podcast when I got to interview Steve Kerr, coach of the Warriors. Oh, yeah. That was cool. Which was so much fun. I got to go to Warriors practice that day. Elijah came with me. Steve Kerr was so smart, so interesting. Everyone at the Warriors was so nice and friendly. And it was just like a very – we obviously got to interview a lot of a million – inspiring great politicians but it was very cool to interview someone from the sports world who was so thoughtful about politics and life and everything else it was so much fun mine was um stephen colbert for offline i i just oh, think that's a good one i am like in awe of that man's talent and kindness just like uh, you know he's hilarious He's so thoughtful about politics. He can talk about politics, religion, the internet. We, we had this like conversation that spanned everything. He was so generous with his time and he was just so, he's a fantastic human being. And uh, I just had such a good conversation with him. Um, all right. T. Penn Barwell says, I want to hear Dan's verdict on Midnight's. <laughs> we have done, I don't know, 10, 12, 20 of these mailbags over the years. There's always a Taylor Swift question. It is never once been I know. directed at me. Never once. And so here's what I would say. And I want to say, I just, I'm just going to say this carefully for all of the people on the internet <laughs> and your wife. Right. Yeah. Who who's definitely going to be Taylor listening Swift. to this. So I have generally in my life never had a strong opinion on Taylor Swift. Hmm. Like I've heard some of the songs. But they've kind of, but not like I've never like really like sat down and listened to the albums. Like I don't dislike or didn't like her. It was just a part of culture I never intersected with in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. It was not really my type of music. But then this year, Kyla, my four-year-old daughter, has started getting into to real music and non-kids music. Congratulations. And she very much <laughs> Yes, and she very much likes Taylor Swift. Uh she likes Shake It Off and Welcome to New York are two songs that she plays on Alexa all the time. And because of that, when Midnight's came out, we started listening to in the car on the way to school and back and forth um, because I, I thought she would like it. B, it's definitely better than Blippi. Um, and I will say, Everything here's my verdict. better than Blippi. Yes. Here, here's that. I like it. It's great. I love the album. I've enjoyed it. I enjoyed listening it with, with her. I've, listen, I've listened to it without her. It's great music for writing the message box. It's great. It is a great album. I, I've been missing out. All this time, you know, you guys just talking Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift, tweeting about Taylor Swift. What does Emily say? All of that. I just wasn't paying attention. And, <laughs> now you and know. I was missing out. Now I know. It was great. You know, you know, you should also listen to, um, you should listen to Folklore and Evermore. Folklore is the album that she came out with during the pandemic. And I have found that people who have not been Taylor Swift fans in the past, it's a good sort of on-ramp to Taylor Swift. Uh, because it's a really, I just, it's a fantastic album. It's how Cody got, Cody became a big Swifty, uh, listen to, listening to folklore. It's a, it's a giant departure for me because basically all the music I listened to my entire life has been hip hop. So this is like an entire, <laughs> like I'm in like a whole new world. It was like the previous, like go to message box writing albums this year were the new Kendrick album and the new Vince Staples album. And now it's midnight. I don't even know. What the fuck very happened. different, very different sounds. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, Dave and a lot of you asked, were you able to snag Taylor Swift tickets? Uh, thanks to Hannah Vitor, who yesterday, like, she had a whole bunch of appointments and things to do. She like dragged her laptop around, and she she got she got tickets to the Vegas show, which is at the end of March. 
Hero. Whoa. Hero. That is. So for all, all four of you are going? Uh, I think she got a couple. Yeah. Well, we'll see if Tom. I don't know if Tommy's definitely in. I'm in. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll see if, we'll see if we get Tommy to come. Um, but I think, yeah, I think she got a bunch of tickets. So that's pretty exciting for, uh, for Hannah. Um, all right. Here's the question. Cheryl Darby asked Dan for book recommendations and me <laughs> for television show recommendations <laughs> because she clearly knows better. Uh, we were also both asked which reality shows we watch. And there were a lot of below deck questions for Dan, including which member of the GOP would make the worst primary charter guest and why is it Paul Ryan? <laughs> Okay, we're right, gonna so, start so with you, that one. You give me all of them. You give me all the. Okay, all your I'm gonna start. We're gonna start with the Paul Ryan one first. Now, my feelings on Paul Ryan are well known, <laughs> probably too well known because I often wonder if Paul Ryan were to go missing, whether someone would show up at my house with a badge and ask some questions. Um, <laughs> but I have to say, I, while I do think Paul Ryan is one of history's great villains, I think he would be a totally fine below deck guest. He seems polite. Yeah. Like his problem. His problem is he's too polite. Kind of a wimp. <laughs> he's too polite. Right. <laughs> He will take a lot of shit from Donald Trump and ask for more. And I think as a, I think he'd be a totally fine blow deck jet guest. So I think there are two possible choices to be the Republican who would be the worst primary charter guest. And it's clear that Trump family is obviously one of them. Yeah. Right. They seem they are obnoxious, demanding, like who knows what sort of international laws uh, that Don Jr. is going to be violating. I'm sure they're really shitty tippers. Um, and then I think Marjorie Taylor Greene would be high on that list, too. Like, I just don't think you'd want to be trapped on a boat with her for two or three days. Like, that doesn't seem great. So I would – either one of those would be, I think, much worse than Paul Ryan. I can't believe you didn't say Ted Cruz. You know, Ted Cruz is – that's true. That Ted Cruz is another option. Few human beings more odious. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I get that's a, that that's a good guess. Ted Cruz would be. I mean, like, look, this there aren't a lot of good answers. In no, this party. That's there's true. not someone that's you'd true. be like, um, like, let me just let me go out to see with Chris Sununu. Like, I don't know. Like, what yeah, other, no, Ted Cruz would be pretty bad. What other reality TV are you guys watching? Um, we have been watching a lot of sort of blow deck. So, cause we're blow. There are so many blow decks right now. I can't keep up. There's blow deck, blow deck, Mediterranean blow deck sailing. Yacht. They just did blow deck down under about Australia and just came up with below deck adventure, which is <laughs> takes place in Norway for reasons. I don't fully understand. I can't keep up with all of that. Wow. Uh, there's so much blow deck. It's, it's like basically the, it's like the real housewives franchise, but on a boat. <laughs> um, we have also been watching like, Southern Charm, Winter House, Summer House, like that whole genre of Bravo shows, which are really something to see. Um, <laughs> you know, it just it's like and now like the the Bravo now does this thing. I guess maybe they've always done. I just didn't notice before is where you can ne it never stops. The like the blow there was always a blow deck on. Blow deck med ends, uh, and then the next week blow deck sailing out starts. Summer House ends, Southern Charm starts, then Winter House. Then we're right back again. You just can't. You're stuck with these people all the time. Um, like that. That's it. And then we started watching, um, you know, we the this absurd show on Netflix called Buying Beverly Hills, which is. Dude, a we have two. <laughs> I mean, a reality show featuring Lisa Renna's husband. And no, sorry, I said that wrong. Oh my god, I'm gonna be yeah, yeah. off the Bravo verse of uh, Kyle Richards's uh husband and daughters selling real estate, high-end real estate in Beverly Hills. It's really I don't really know what we're doing with our lives. <laughs> it is I I I can't even talk about that show. We watched a couple episodes and it was uh just horrifying to me. I also have I have It's better than it's better than Selling Sunset. See, Emily I will not I did not want to watch Selling Sunset and we started watching Buying Beverly Hills and Emily was like just just watch Selling Sunset because I think it's much better than Buying Beverly Hills. And I and I was See, like, I, you know what? I don't need another one of these. And I, I also, like the ins and outs of the real estate business, which is why I like million dollar <laughs> listing. I like I want to see the bid. I want to know how long they're going to be in escrow, the closing <laughs> time. Selling Sunset, like real estate, it's very real estate adjacent. Okay. And I have also completely avoided all the housewife shows, like up until this year when uh, Emily made me watch an episode of. Uh, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, and I was appalled. But then it was like watching a car wreck, and I ended up watching the whole season. And by the end, I was like, "Oh, I have! To, I not only have to watch the final episode, I have to watch the reunion." <laughs> oh, you all? Th you mean all three parts of the reunion? Yes, like, absolutely, you do. And then we'll sit there, and I was like, "Who's your favorite character?" I'm like, "There's no favorite. This is appalling." <laughs> 
<laughs> but you can't you can't avert your eyes. It, you, you're it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. I, I was the same way. I sucked in, and this is this is where I am. It's like sports. Every once in a while, we'll get some prestige TV in, and then just more unbelievable. rich people doing dumb shit. Erica Jane, she's trying to keep the earrings. Give the earrings back. Come on. <laughs> I mean, she's been involved in a real legal drama for There's a, long a lot time, of too. crime involved in this, yes. I, which I was not expecting. I probably should have. Should, should we? Uh, I mean, did you, did you watch Real Housewives? Check out Real Housewives in New Jersey when <laughs> Donald Trump had to deport Teresa Judice's husband for committing crimes. <laughs> uh, any other real television shows that you guys are watching? I mean, we do love Yellowstone, and that is back oh. this week. Um, we White Lotus season two love is love White um, Lotus. Yeah. That's what we're That's yeah. Very good. I, I'm I'm very excited about White Lotus. The Good Fight just ended. It was the series finale of Good Fight. I got into that show and I never watched The Good Wife. I The Good Wife is excellent. I think I think if you're a fan of Pod Save America, you will like the good you will like the uh, the Good Fight. Yeah. All right, let's do books really fast. All right, so yeah, I'll, books. I'll, Go I'll for do it. I'll do three books um, that I really love this year. Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel, who wrote uh, Station Eleven which is a book about a pandemic that was phenomenal before the pandemics, but she's just an incredible author. I read everything she writes. Um, a, another book called The Devil Takes You Home by a guy named Gabino Iglesias, which is, it's a sort of a fantastical uh, crime noir book written uh, that takes place on the Texas-Mexico border that is just great. I just loved it. Oh, wow. And then one kid's book recommendation that uh, I that we have been reading a lot. It's this book series uh, called Mia Mayhem about a little girl who becomes a superhero. Oh. Kyla loves it. There's like 14 of them in the series. We read them all the time. We are very in on the adventures of Mia Mayhem and her friends, Ali Oomph and Pen Powers. It's they're great books. It's like little chapter books for kids around that age. Uh, and they're awesome. That's great. Uh, what have I read lately? I'm going to give you some offline books. <laughs> <laughs> The Chaos Machine by Max Fisher was fantastic about uh, social media, and he did like just years of reporting in these uh, tech companies. Uh, Dopamine Nation by Anna Lemke, which is about phone addiction and why it's like other addictions. Um, Grace by Cody Keenan. Grace. Yeah, I've, that's important. I know, I, but I just have to, to give Cody a plug again. Yes. And and the last novel I read, I've already said this on the pod, but The Candy House by Jennifer Egan is fantastic. Um, all right. Mike Carvalho is a Toronto Raptors fan who wants to know, does Dan hate the Raptors? Does he actually kind of like them? Is he completely indifferent? I promise no matter what the answer is, I won't be mad. All right. So Mark will not be mad. Okay. Mark, I want to tell you this. As a general rule when it comes to sports, I do not have hate in my heart. I just don't. And I certainly do not have hate for the Toronto Raptors, even though they did uh, famously and infamously beat the Sixers in the playoffs on a buzzer beater from Kawhi Leonard that basically destroyed the franchise for years to come. But so uh -oh. I so I, I do knew not, there was I a like, butt coming. So I'm going to say this. I like I like the Raptors. I enjoy watching those Raptors. I think the nurse is a great coach. I, the Raptors are everything I wish the Sixers were. They draft the right players. They run an actual offense. They were great. The only there are only two teams that I have hate in my heart for, and the Raptors are not one of them. It is the Syracuse Orangemen because I went to Georgetown university oh. and it's the Boston Celtics. And it is the Boston Celtics. I'm wow. To my, to my Boston bros. I can't, I don't want to have that hate in my heart. I can't <laughs> help it, but it's it, like, if you're a Philadelphia 76ers fan starting in the eighties, then you are, you're raised to hate the Celtics. And I've, I've tried, I've done, tried to do meditation and other things to take that out, but I can't do it. I just, I grew up at such an interesting time to be a Boston fan because it's like, when I was a kid, we were like, like, like no one hated Boston teams because we weren't winning everything. And then like to now have like, there's so much hate for the Patriots here. It's just a weird, it's a, it's been a weird transition. I mean, Celtics hate's been around for, for a long time. time. They, so, were, yeah. they were, they were good when you were, when you were growing up, but right. like, obviously uh, you were lovable losers for the Red Sox, the Red and, Sox the Patriots and the Patriots and, for a long time um, until you adopted cheating. <laughs> There we go. See? <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, Sarah asks, what do you guys contribute to your Thanksgiving tables? Um, my answer is takes. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Just good conversation from me. Actually, I don't even know if it's all good. Conversation. Because <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't cook anything. I do clean up afterwards. I love doing the dishes. I love cleanliness. I will clean the whole table. I will do all of that. But I'm, I'm not great at uh, I, I can't really cook. What about you? Well, I cook the turkey. 
Wow. I cook the green bean casserole. Oh my goodness. And I cook the mashed sweet potatoes every year. That's this a, year that's I am a not, lot. We've hosted at our house the last like four years. This year we are not hosting. We're going to Hallie's aunt's house. So I we're I am contributing pies from a bakery this year. But in general, I and I love cooking Thanksgiving dinner. It's like one of my favorite things to do. Um so I love eating it. I'm excited. Um All right, Sharon asks, last question. What are you thankful for this year, personally and professionally? Do you want to go first? Uh, Sure. Uh, Personally, I am thankful for this, my wonderful, like, joyful son, Charlie. He's just like, I didn't get when parents were like, oh, this is the best age. And now he's like, when he turned two, I'm like, oh, yeah, this really is the best age. He's like talking all the time. The other day we like sat there and talked to each other for like a half hour. It's great. Uh, I love it. So I'm grateful for him. Grateful for my wife. Grateful that we're healthy. Grateful that like the, the that we're out of the worst phase of the pandemic and like life has been returning to normal. I'm like very grateful for that. Professionally, I just want to say that I am incredibly grateful for all of you who signed up for Vote Save America and for what you did in this midterm. Just some stats before I let Dan go. In 2022, everyone who uh, participated in Vote Save America, you donated more than $5.3 million towards candidates and grassroots organizations. That's nearly double what you donated in 2018, and that was a year that uh, Democratic enthusiasm was a little bit easier to come by. Nearly 34,000 of you signed up for Midterm Madness. Again, we nearly doubled the 2018 number of volunteers and events. And just so you all know, the single biggest day for volunteer signups was the day of the Dobbs leak. The second biggest day was the day of the Dobbs decision. And the number of volunteers doubled in the months after that. So I want to thank everyone in the Vote Save America community. I want to thank our team at Vote Save America, Shaniqua, EJ, Sarah, Julia, Eric, Dayanita, Tanya, all of our volunteers who worked so hard this midterm season to make Vote Save America what it was. So I am very professionally grateful for that. So personally, I am very grateful for my family. Everyone is healthy and happy. And my brother just moved to the West Coast with his wife and my niece. And so they are closer and my parents are here a lot more. And so we get to see everyone. It's just like Kyla's amazing. Jack's amazing. Everything, everything is great family wise. So could not be happier, you know. And, and as you said, being like life feels while not completely normal, a lot more normal than it than it has for a very long time. And they're like activities for Kyla's school, and we're seeing things and like being in the classroom. All like life feels really good. And professional is exactly what you said. It is this incredible community of people who listen to Pod Save America and other crooked media content and volunteer at Vote Save America. And the, and it's been wonderful in this election cycle that we've gotten out on the road to see them again. Yeah. We got, I was at a swing left bus kickoff the weekend before the election, talking to a bunch of people, some of them you know, wearing merch, VSA volunteers from the community who were out there. And it's just like it is a it is this great privilege to be part of this community and be part of this effort. And it's something that I thought, you know, was it just with unexpected, sort of this unexpected gift uh, in this next chapter of my life professionally that I'm very grateful for. Absolutely. All right. That's all we got. Everyone, uh, enjoy your Thanksgiving this week, and we'll talk to you next week. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. The Crooked Store and Crooked Coffee just launched a huge Black Friday sale in time for the holidays. We're offering 25% off site wide with code SAVE25. And since we have a very important runoff on December 6th, We'll be donating a portion of the proceeds to Vote Save America's Every Last Vote Fund to ensure that every single person who wants to vote can have their voice heard and get people to the polls. Uh, Offer ends Monday the 28th, so head to crooked.com slash holiday to shop and learn more.